Thank you for attending this session on social inclusion through advocacy and change, two Cleveland case studies. Today's speakers will be Jessica Wobig, Bella Sin, and Laura Syraki. Jessica Wobig is an architectural historian with more than a decade of experience. They're based in Cleveland, Ohio, and work as a cultural resources consultant. In 2010, their career began as an AmeriCorps member with the Cleveland Landmarks Commission. Today, they carry on their service by providing professional volunteer services to underrepresented communities facing urgent preservation needs. Bella Sin is an advocate for LGBT plus rights and community leader. Bella has cultivated a burlesque and drag entertainment industry for more than 19 years in Cleveland, Ohio. This year, they were recognized as the top 24th performer in the world. Their indigenous Mexican ancestry inspires their creative works as well as their advocacy for heritage conservation. Bella became aware that Club Azteca was proposed to be replaced by new mixed use construction. They moved to action by providing research, planning, and outreach support to the Club Azteca Coalition and are working on further conservation efforts, including archiving the club's collection. Laura Syraki is a Hessler resident for more than 20 years. Laura has applied her expertise in botany as an educator, cook, and gardener at Hannah Perkins School in Shaker Heights since 2000. In 2021, the first demolition and infill construction was planned for her historic district. She took action by organizing advocacy campaigns for historic preservation along with the Hessler Coalition and brought attention to the urgent need for increased preservation planning in University Circle neighborhood. Today's objectives will be to explore how implicit bias affects the development process and preservation practice. We'll be examining two case studies, the Save Club Azteca and Keep Hessler Historic Campaigns. We'll seek to understand how local preservation processes affect social inclusion outcomes. We'll be applying methods for heritage conservation that promote social inclusion and local preservation and the real estate development process. And lastly, we'll be discussing next steps, organizations to support, and sharing out. What you see in front of you is a blue dot. I would like you to spend about 10 seconds exploring and observing and looking and seeing this blue dot. Pay attention to how you feel, things you observe, and what you see. Much like history, when you look and see a blue dot and you're told to look and see a blue dot, that is all you're observing. Some, some of you may have spent the last 10 seconds wondering to yourself, why is she asking me to look at a blue dot? Others may have noticed the shade of the blue dot, that it has a slightly different outline, and that it's not necessarily within the center of the screen. Heritage is wide and spans a diverse audience. All of us come with our own cultural bias and observations and histories. Much like the blue dot, history asks us to look and see more than just one central idea. To understand that purpose, we have to sit back and ask, what is real estate development? Real estate development is a business process. It builds new buildings, it removes historic buildings, and it often leases um, existing buildings. Whereas historic preservation is an endeavor that seeks to preserve historical significance. Historic preservation overlaps with real estate development because we try to save and preserve buildings. However, there's a different aspiration when we come to our own implicit bias. An implicit bias is a form of bias that occurs automatically and unintentionally. It's in all of us. We all carry it from different angles. It affects our judgments, decisions, and behaviors. Not only is real estate development and historic preservation activities that we do that require our judgments, decision, and behaviors, but with that, we carry an implicit bias on how those things get done. And today, our session asks that we apply social inclusion, which is a process for improving the in and enhancing opportunities with access to resources, a voice, and respect for rights of underrepresented groups. When it comes to the practice of historic preservation and our overlapping relationship with real estate development, we must overcome our own implicit bias by acknowledging that exist and then seek to ask within our own communities and in our own endeavors, are there social inclusion processes within what we're doing? 
because in order to succeed as historic preservationists, we must ensure that we're connecting underrepresented groups with the same resources that we ourselves as historic preservationists have. Jesse Jackson, a politician and civil rights activist, has been quoted as saying, inclusion is not a matter of political correctness. It is the key to growth. And with that idea, we're asking historic preservation that in real, real estate development, we're seeking to grow opportunities and access and improve the quality of life for our own communities. So it's not an idea of being politically correct or not when we're talking about applying processes like social inclusion to our work. It's how we grow, it's how we thrive, and it's how we ensure that the same opportunities are presented within our own uh, greater communities. Development projects include need, opportunity, resources, and an effective place. That effective place in our purpose as historic preservationists is a historic resource. The stakeholders involved may be the developer, the agency, either a funding agency or permitting agency, advocates either for or against the project, and again that silent voice of the his affected historic place. Influential factors in these projects include media and public engagement, so not only what's being shared but how it's being shared and received, the ownership of that property, if it's a private resource, is the owner willing to ensure that social inclusion is being considered as part of this real estate development? The condition and economics surrounding the care of this historic resource are also pivotal in how real estate development is carried out within historic preservation. For underrepresented groups, this means that disinvestment within communities has often presented preservation as a hindrance to progress due to the condition of resources, in many cases beyond the control of the underrepresented groups being affected by these developments. Other influential factors include policy. Are there policies in place that require social inclusion to be considered as part of a development? The intention of the agency or developer, the perception of is it politically correct or not to carry this out, and the support either to save or remove a resource often depends on the voice that is being presented at the table. That's where historic preservation comes in. Historic preservation can lead social inclusion and re real estate development. The sphere of influence has been long and laid out since historic preservation has resources, it knows how to move agencies and advocates together, and how to support developers in preserving historic places. Ultimately, historic preservation can help raise up the voice and ensure that social inclusion is applied into real estate development. As this figure presents the city of Cleveland, the gold circles are national register listed properties and the black circles are the local landmarks. As you'll see, they're clustered within the center of downtown, which is at the top middle of the screen, and they extend west to east along with a commercial corridor. Many of these designations resulted from the need to apply for federal funds or incentives, such as the Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit. If it wasn't for federal incentives that helped incentivize historic preservation, many of these designations would not be on this map today. But you'll see that local designations are slightly farther out into the neighborhoods, but they're still largely clustered around this commercial area. So what that shows us is that a large geography of this historic city, which has more than 100 years of development, is absent from designations. In Cleveland, there's 360,000 plus people, of which 34.2% identify as white alone, in comparison to the 59.3% who identify white alone at a national level. 11.9% identify as Hispanic or Latino in Cleveland. This is compared to the 18.9% who identify as Hispanic or Latino at a national level. Of the more than 90,000 historic properties that are listed in the National Register of Historic Places, less than 8% represent black, indigenous, and people of color or other underrepresented groups, including women. In Cleveland, there's currently 345 landmarks that are standing today, of which 
29 historic districts also stand. None of those historic designations represent historic or Latino heritage in Cleveland, and none of them represent social um, achievements such as those carried out in the mid-20th century on Hessler Road. This call to action will provide you with two case studies where leaders within the historic preservation community in Cleveland have moved social inclusion as part of preservation within real estate development projects. Hola, me llamo Belacín. I became aware of the Azteca Cup project through the Young Latino Network and the Comité Mexicano. This landmark has been in Cleveland for quite some time, and there was a multitude of people trying to save it, but there seemed to be no unison in voice, and that's where me and Jessica Walbing came in. The club was located in 5602 Detroit Road, and it also was known as Casa Mexico, which was one of the central locations that organized in the 1920s. Felix Delgado was the first president of the club. When it was purchased, the building was on Detroit Avenue in 1951. It was rehabilitated and opened its doors in 1957. This put Latino history in the forefront in the city of Cleveland. Not only Mexican-American history, but the history of Puerto Ricanos and Cubanos in Cleveland. We connected with Latino, Latinos in Conservation there to come to find out that we were present as early as the late 1800s in Cleveland as Latinos through farming communities in the Bracero movement, which touched Lorraine. The significant representation of American Latino heritage in the immigrant stories were abundant. And they had a multitude of people involved in our community from oral stories sharing through different websites online and also just families sharing stories from both the Puerto Rican and the Mexican community with each other. It created access to heritage conservation and a connection to education, training, and employment opportunities within the field. Also, it grew historic preservation perspectives to include heritage conservation. Here in Ohio, that is looking pretty dim at the moment because we haven't touched on the idea of historic preservation and heritage pre conservation within one bout. When we got involved with the Azteca project, we knew we were fighting an uphill battle that already was what it was going to become, which was a educational campaign to try to save any piece of the building. Our timeline went from Waverly and Oak development um, publicly announced following several years of planning and development of the site on 2421. The community rally happened on 2-24-21. The landmark's conceptual design happened in 2-25-21. The landmark's approval was on 4-8-21. The building documentation was 6-1-21, which when we entered the building documentation, we found a 20-foot Mexican flag that was hand-painted in stone that used to be used for the celebrations of Cinco de Mayo and the Mexican Independence Day. Flag dated circa 1930s and was prepared for proper storage by the Pivot Center Intermuseum Conservation Association, ICA, on 7-13-21. This discovery held for us the meaning of where are these things now and can we start something in conversation with our local governments, councilmen, about social justice and heritage preservation. An anticipated discovery was the sign recovered on 8-121, the day of the cleanout, 
for the building for the Casa Mexico sign that once hung at the Azteca Club. That sign predates into 1930s. Club Azteca demolition happened on 10-14-21. One of our main goals was facadism, preserving the f face of the building and hopefully building around it, but unfortunately we were not so lucky. We received a large amount of support from different groups from the Comité Mexicano, the Young Latino Network, Nikki Antonio, our state senator, and there were many accounts in the media of trying to save this Mexican landmark. When we pushed forward to try to recognize that we have been here and we will always be here, it put forward the thought process of what other history is here from Mexican individuals. Once diving into this, we come to find that it's more than just the Club Azteca. It was the whole of the Latino community as Club Azteca served as the landing mark for people that needed aid. They were Latino and spoke Spanish. When the Puerto Rican migration started, they were here to help them, aid them, and help develop their neighborhoods, as well as the Cuban migration. More Baracero movement members started coming and staying, and the Mexican community started flourishing even through the rates through the 1930s of the Repatriation Act Acts. When we're talking between the 1950s and the 1960s, Latinos exploded in the United States, and Ohio was no different. But nobody was talking about the preservation efforts. The discovery of the flag was something that I can only express into tears as a Mexican national. Finding our flag in foreign cities, especially when it was made by our people, is extremely rare, especially in this size, to find something this large. But these things belong in a museum. Now forward, we're moving into the discussion of what does preservation and rediscovery comes through the outcome that we had. So partnerships, we formed partnerships with the Azteca Coalition. Multiple different organizations joined together and merged to be part of each other. So it was Club Azteca, Comité Mexicano, uh, the Mexican American Historical Association of Cleveland was created and it's currently working on putting forward the Mexican American history in Cleveland. We started talking about preserving projects, including building documentation, Ohio history marker collection of digitization and archival efforts to not lose our history again. We're trying to work with different agencies on this, but the work is slow and we're still trying to connect with anybody that will be willing to hear us. A potential of Latino Heritage Museum of Cleveland. This is the ultimate goal. One of the biggest conversations we've been having with people is this is not just something that we donate to our local museums here because those museums are still buried in institutionalized whiteness and it's not accessible to Latino people. So us being able to also be our own storytellers and our own preservers and our own educators of our own history is incredibly important, especially when we talk about social justice and preservation. This is incredibly important because a lot of people learn that, that we have been here and we were not trying to s just take space here. We were trying to educate people into understanding that Mexican communities have been here for a very long time and we were sewn into the fabric of the city. We're hoping that continuing to present things like this will have a thinking cap in all the individuals that watch it and say, what can I do to help this be of, of fruition? What we can access to go ahead and have this become part of our community? The African American Museum exists, and so can a Latino museum exist. We see these in communities like LA and Chicago. Often the pushback is that we don't have that type of community here, but that's where I beg a differ. How we embrace a whole of Cleveland, not just parts of it, because in the end of the day, telling the stories of everybody that took hand into building the city is what we should be doing as historians, not just choosing and picking history from a building that held once upon a time 
a community of people that were challenging everything that was happening to just make the American dream possible. So, um, my name is Laura Soraki, and I am not a preservationist. I am a resident in Cleveland's first historic district. Um, I've been living there for 24 years, and it's a quaint little brick and wood block road in an arts, eds, and meds district. And for 50 years, um, the land has been very desirable to the institutions around it. And um, we've kind of lived in this little historic district under constant pressure um, because of that, because of the value of the land. So the, the historic district I live in it is called the Hessler Court and Hessler Road Historic District. And it was designated as Cleveland First Landmark District in 1975 by a group of architecture students at the nearby university who saw the value of uh, the district for a couple of reasons, because it represented uh, one of Cleveland's first middle-class neighborhoods in this traditionally very uh, wealthy area called University Circle. Um, traditionally, on Hessler, we have a street fair called the Hessler Street Fair, which was started to bring awareness uh, in 1969 to the district, which was being ignored by the city and um, eventually would probably have been demolished had it not been for the, this group of students and some committed residents who actually, before they even got the district designated a historic district, decided that preservation needed to be a priority in Cleveland and work together to get the landmarks department implemented in City Hall. So you could sort of essentially say that the preservation movement in Cleveland started on Hesley Road. Concurrently with preservation work, there was a large um, tenants union movement and affordable housing and safe living condition uh, movement to hold landlords accountable in the district. It, it sort of became apparent in the 70s that um, a, the largest local landlord was who was a representative of the institutions was allowing their properties to go to demolition by neglect and that's when the um, students and residents living in the district said we have to stop this and um, ask for a safer living conditions and preservation and so from fast forward from 19, the mid-70s to the present, the district has remained largely unchanged. It's been a haven for um, artists, musicians, students, students, uh, art students and music students, and then students at the local university. Um, and sort of it's been occupied by a combination of long-term residents who created a housing cooperative in the early 80s in order to maintain affordable housing um, and students. And the housing on Hessler is actually still pretty affordable relative to the rest of University Circle where for the most part all the historic and affordable housing has been demolished for the expansion of institutions. So we, Hessler is sort of the last remaining affordable housing in the district. Um, and Hessler represents a, I would say an area that um, has been able to hold on to its housing we have linked arms actually with surrounding communities, um, both Little Italy and um, the Wade Park and Magnolia Historic District just outside of Hessler, a traditionally African American district, to try to hold the institutions accountable and ask for responsible expansion and not at the sake of our communities. We became threatened this, let's see, let's see a year ago in um, February of 2021 
with a high-end market rate housing development, a micro arena apartment development in the historic district. So in January of 2021, I received an email from the local institution that manages the development in University Circle that there would be a development coming to Hessler Road. And naturally, I panicked because it, it's a tiny historic district and it's very fragile, has a 115-year-old infrastructure. And getting a taste of the development around University Circle, I knew that it probably wasn't going to be affordable and likely wouldn't fit within the district. And sure enough, on February 10th, the uh, developers and the CDC, the local CDC, hosted a, a Zoom presentation and revealed their plans to build a 26 micro unit apartment building in the backyard of a historic home in the district. The meeting was held in webinar format. There were 50 or so participants, none of whom we could tell who they were. We, we, there were some residents present, present on Zoom. Um, we knew by the, the comments and question, or the questions they were answering and, and asking in the um, Q&A, but we couldn't see or hear each other, and we had no idea who the other, there were about 15 residents and property owners um, tuned into the meeting and the rest of the people in the meeting, we had no idea who they were except the panelists. So it was uh, presented to us as a done deal and naturally we uh, gathered and linked arms. We raised a lot of we, ruckus and <laughs> we asked our council person to help us out. We reached out to the landmarks department. We reached out to our city planner. Um, we tried to create some kind of awareness about the fragile nature and the historic um, significance of our fight for affordable housing and safe housing on Hessler and pushed for more, pushed to have a voice in, in the development process, which was coming at us at a rapid pace. Um, it became clear pretty quickly that there was very little we could do in spite of 1,500 petition signatures and 70 letters of opposition to the development. Um, and we felt very isolated in our fight and, and misunderstood because of, I would say, maybe a, a local urbanist movement to to have development in Cleveland at all costs. And so we um, we were feeling pretty weighed down and not making any headway in, in the design review process and in the Landmarks Commission reviews until on social media, we had a couple of preservationists reach out to us. And I had no awareness of preservation work really, preservation as a career, or a preservation movement. I lived in a historic district that I cared very deeply about. I was able to live there because, um, you know, I'm, I'm working class and I would not have been able to afford to live there had it not been for the people before me who fought for the housing cooperative to keep rent affordable there. Um, so I, I was living and enjoying this very, living in and enjoying this very peaceful community um, with my other, well, working class and middle class neighbors. And um, the bubble sort of popped when, <laughs> when the development was presented to us. I would say there was a lot of pressure to uh, get the development approved. It was political. And though a lot of people behind the scenes told us that they disagreed with the development as it was proposed in our historic district, um, they couldn't say anything because of their relations within the city. And it's uh, the, 
the way it would jeopardize them if they spoke up on our behalf. So we were left alone a lot until um, Jessica Wobig and Preservation Ohio reached out to us uh, because they had caught wind of our struggle on social media. And when the preservationist reached out to us, it was the first time we really felt understood. It was, for the first time, we weren't just being told we were NIMBYs opposing development and getting in the way of progress. Um, somebody, there, there were preservationists there who understood our social and historical struggle. They understood the fragility of the district. They understood how jeopardized our, um, our uh, lifestyle would be. Uh, they understood the significance of our street fair, which it, we call it a 50-year-old street fair, but in the struggle to save and preserve Hustler, we found out that it's actually much older than, than 50 years old, dates back all the way to 1949, and well, and maybe further. Um, we also found out through the struggle a lot more history about Hustler, and we learned that there was a long history of um, artists, designers, architects, musicians, and writers living on the living in in the area, um, and we had learned that they planned a uh, development in the late twenties, and they were all going to move off of Hessler together so they could have a community, an artist community nearby, and actually that community did get developed, um, but the people on Hessler stayed. They didn't move off of Hessler together in the 20s. Um, but it was, it's been an interesting uh, journey learning about the history of Hessler. And, and though it get, has this sort of identity as being a um, hippie, kind of 1969 um, counterculture uh, place, it's actually a much older uh, counterculture place, I guess. What we started to do in working with Jessica and working with Preservation Ohio is get some language and figure out ways to um, get attention uh, for the district. And we quickly learned through our struggle that not only um, was Hessler jeopardized, but Pretty much all historic districts and historic buildings in Cleveland um, don't have the kind of protections afforded them by the landmarks ordinance. So we linked arms with with preservationists and other his, other um, neighborhoods around Cleveland and have started a sort of citywide movement to bring awareness to preservation issues throughout Cleveland as they relate to architecture, but also to social history. And we're in a, as it stands now, the, the, um, on Hessler, the developer did not renew his variances for the micro unit apartment building, though he's keeping the parcel that he created out of the backyard of a historic home open for development. Um, and we are just asking to be involved in the process, to be brought to the table about what goes on in terms of development in and around the district, and we're asking for a preservation plan. And in doing all of this work and connecting with other neighborhoods around the city in historic districts and outside of historic districts, we're finding out that there are people who want to preserve their heritage, architectural and cultural heritage, all over the city. And slowly, little by little, we're trying to get to work with the city and get the planning department and the landmarks department to understand the value of um, these pockets of culture and history in Cleveland and why it's important to preserve those. Um, it's an uphill battle, but I think the thing that we have gained is we have a team. We have a kernel of a movement. Um, we have, we are giving voice to people who have not ever had a voice. We are reaching out to people who, for example, have 
uh, historic buildings in their neighborhoods that want to get preserved. Um, and we're, we're trying to, you know, say to the city and, and to the powers that be that um, though we are grassroots and, and maybe we don't bring the kind of financial resources to the table that developers and large institutions bring to the table, we are what makes Cleveland Cleveland and snuffing us out uh, will be to the detriment of the city in the long run. Um, and so, you know, it's, we're working, it's, it's happening, it's, it's difficult, it's tiring. I know I don't have to, I know the preservationists all know this work is hard. Um, and, um, but we have each other and we have a lot of diversity and we have, uh, passion <laughs> and, uh, once we find each other, I think we can shift the way preservation is done in Cleveland. Now that you've heard the stories of Club Azteca and Hessler Road and the fight to preserve Cleveland's heritage, in your communities, examine social inclusion policies, either existing or where needed. Go ahead and ask your certified local government, your city, your municipality, or even your state historic preservation office what social inclusion policies are available to help you preserve your communities or uplift and encourage the preservation of underrepresented histories. We hope you understand from this that local preservation processes are structured and affected by social inclusion outcomes. This means that we must take action to ensure that social inclusion is applied to historic preservation. We ask that you demand methods for heritage conservation that promote social inclusion and local preservation and the real estate development process. These methods are already available through tools that have been practiced in historic preservation for more than 50 years. Lastly, we ask that you monitor available resources and opportunities and share out within your community. Together, network together, we're able to do more. If you'd like to help support some organizations that are working in Cleveland. The Comité Mexicano de Cleveland was founded in 2016 to promote Mexican art and culture, identifying services that will help support Mexican residents and support academic and social research related to Mexican community in the greater Cleveland and Northeast Ohio area. Donations are welcome for the Jardín Mexicano, a New Mexican cultural garden in the Cleveland Cultural Gardens. Young Latina Network, founded in 2002 by a group of hardworking and forward-thinking young Latino professionals, empowers the Latino community through leadership, development, and civic engagement. Joining, join as a Latinx member and ally membership is available. If you are interested in learning more about Hessler and the work we're doing to keep Hessler historic, you can um, visit the web at www.hesslerstreet.wordpress.com and there's a link to our change.org petition. We're still collecting signatures there and you can read a little bit about Hessler and connect with us if you have any questions. Dr. Stephanie Ryberg Webster with the Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University stated recently in an article that crafting an inclusive preservation requires understanding and changing the use and distribution of power within the field. It means acknowledging the preservationists are not powerless idealists and that through their work, they have the power to undermine progress towards a more just society or preferably to uplift and shine a light on the full story of our communities, cities, and nation.